items that you'll need for Kinsey, uh, glass sheet, palette knives, uh, one flat, one pointed, helps to mix, some masking tape or rubber bands, and in some instances you won't need either, flour that is high protein, uh, ki urushi, and water. These are the basic items that you'll end up needing to do traditional kintsugi with a basic repair of adhering a couple different shards together into one piece. You'll start off by looking at the pieces and finding out how many breaks you have. This piece has about 50 different breaks in it. You can see it's been consolidated together with both uh, masking tape and rubber bands. You can see some little pieces inside that are still floating around that will have to get adhered to it. This is a very complex repair. It will take probably a month or two to repair. This is an old piece, a piece made by Bill Geisinger. You can see a small hairline crack that runs through the base and up through the side. This is a piece that has been repaired in the past, um, but has gone through a dishwasher over the course of multiple years. And given some hot liquid, finally got to the point where it won't break. Uh, slightly different repairs needed there. Here is a traditional oil spot Temaku tea bowl. Uh, this one was made by me, knocked off a counter by uh, a cat. And as you can see, there are several pieces Overall, this is a relatively basic repair. Uh, what you will notice though, is some of these pieces are missing glaze on one or the other side. So it is a slightly more complex than a simple Kintsugi repair. The one thing that you do always want to do is check the order that pieces have to get put together, knowing your order that things need to be put together uh, determines how easy a repair will end up going. And as you can see here, multiple pieces. Now the piece that we're gonna to repair today is this cup. Um, what you can see, it's a relatively even break down the center, uh, goes together quite easily. But what you'll also notice is that there's some small areas of missing shards that will have to be backfilled. And not only that, when I get the other pieces together to figure out exactly how it goes together, you'll notice uh, even break on that side with one additional piece coming out. That should be relatively easy to deal with. Um, opposite side, I am actually missing a couple uh, pieces. So what you'll notice is the next piece that I have in fits quite nicely in this little area. But what you'll notice is there's a small area on the left-hand side that is missing a shard on the right as well. That is something that I'm gonna end up having to compensate for by making additional material. So the first step is to know my order of repair. I'm gonna start off with this side because it's an even line. If I adhere this piece here, it's gonna allow me to have one solid piece that I can then get the second half of the cup and put it together. And then all I'll have to deal with is that uh, fourth piece here, which I don't have uh, either shard for either side that I will end up having to be fabricating a piece uh, to fill. So uh, first step here is getting our materials out to mix our arushi. Uh, you start off anytime you're adhering things together uh, with a flour. You wanna have something that has a good amount of protein and gluten in it, but not too, too much. This is a high protein wheat flour. Uh, you can also use uh, mochi flour, but this high protein wheat flour, the wheat protein acts as a binder that is uh, better than uh, the rice, the, the amount of gluten in it also adheres uh, and makes a very good colloidal structure that helps to hold everything together. And we begin by mixing some water in with our flour. Uh, use a palette knife. I like this flat palette knife to do the work. Uh, I slowly combine and I am making a relatively thick uh, wheat paste, uh, similar to the wheat paste that used to be used for uh, paper conservation and uh, hanging of posters and things like that. Uh, stuff that is reversible is when you're making this type of paste using a predominantly wheat starch uh, that they use in book binding. Uh, and also in, in conservation of paperwork. This here has slightly more protein in it, and as a byproduct of that, it's a little bit more of a permanent adhesive. You could use this in theory to adhere two halves of a cup together. It would work temporarily, but given enough time, it would fail. Um, and what we're doing here is we're mixing this up. This is, works as a 
temporary binder, uh, a temporary adhesive while our Arushi goes through the hydration process that causes it to form uh, the adhesive that holds everything together. Um, what you can see that I'm doing is I'm slowly getting my powder and I am pressing it into the water and pushing it back and forth using the back half of the pallet knife to smash it down using the side half to make sure I scrape it together. Right now I have a relatively good consistency. You can see that it does have some uh, adhesion right now to it. You can see it's sticking to the pallet knife and it requires me to put some strong force on the back end of the pallet knife to scrape it off. At this stage, I'm gonna be adding my Arushi, and what you'll notice that I'm doing here is I'm doubling up my pair of gloves. I wear one under pair of gloves uh, that I keep the wrists long on, and another pair of over gloves that I keep the wrists short on. This allows me to, if I get any Arushi on my hands, it allows me to take off the gloves without contaminating my wrists. So it's something that I personally do. I've never had an allergic dermatitis reaction to Arushi. Uh, that's not to say that I won't. So I'm always a little bit more cautious. Uh, this, what I'm gonna be adding here is Ki Arushi. Ki Arushi is the refined sap of the Arushi tree. Uh, traditionally what is done is score marks are carved into the side of the tree and that sap is then collected. That sap, uh, the Arushiol, is then uh, boiled down to remove some of the water content. And that is what Ki Arushi is. It's the basic first step of refined Arushi. I'm gonna to try to add to the best of my ability here by eyeballing volume wise, uh, one part Arushi to one part of that mixed flour water uh, adhesive. And I'm gonna mix it together uh, just like I did with the flour and water using the side and back of the palette knife, uh, trying to make sure that I can get it mixed together and incorporated to the best of my ability. And smoothing it out the consistency should be very similar to a thin bean paste. Uh, I, in this particular step, did not quite add enough arushi, so I'll be adding a little bit more in a second, but I wanna make sure what I do have, I've mixed up really, really well. So using the back part of the palette knife to really scrape the stuff against the glass, uh, pick it up, put it back down, re-smear it in using the back part of the palette knife. I will do that several times until I have what I feel is a really good mix. Nothing magical here, just taking a little bit of time, making sure that I mix it properly. I mentioned a second ago that Arushi, uh, traditional Japanese lacquer, uh, can cause an allergic dermatitis. Uh, essentially, the oil that causes it to solidify is the same exact oil that's in poison oak, poison shumac, poison ivy, also in the shell of the cashew nut. So if you have ever had any severe allergic reaction to any of those uh, plants before, arushi is probably something you wanna try to avoid. Looking here, the paste was a little bit too thick, so I'm gonna add a little bit more arushi to my mix so that I can thin it out. You don't want a paste that's too thick. Uh, realize you're adding an adhesive between two pieces of shards, and when you're squeezing them together, uh, some of it is gonna be bulging out where that crack is. If you have too thick of a material and you can't squeeze out any excess material, what will end up happening is it will distort the shape that you are putting together. Uh, so it's, it's uh, important to get used to using the material so that you can mix it up so it's not too thick, but at the same time, not too thin. Not too thick uh, to distort the shape of the piece, but at the same time, not too thin that it's not gonna aid in good adhesion. So same steps as before, mixing that Arushi and uh, flour mixture together. So now I'm gonna bring in the piece that uh, I'm gonna repair here. It was a relatively clean break. There's a small piece that's missing and where that's missing, there's a small hairline crack that I just pointed out. Um, this piece is gonna sit in here. The hairline crack I'm gonna deal with after I have the piece together. Uh, what I'm gonna do right now though, is I'm gonna start the process. Using a palette knife, uh, this palette knife I'm gonna start with because I have a longer break. I may end up switching to a smaller palette knife in a second. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up a little bit of the lacquer 
and I'm gonna adhere it on the surface. I'm just gonna drag the tool. And actually, this tool is a little bit too big, so let me grab a finer bladed palette knife. I'm gonna pick up a little bit of lacquer, and I'm gonna put it along the crack and thin out the material. And every time I remove the spatula, you could see that, that stickiness um, that is added to this uh, adhesive of Arushi uh, by the wheat flour that has been mixed with the water. It's, it's, it's a great adhesive in its own right, uh, not as permanent, but when you mix the Arushi to it, it forms a repair that is very hard to remove. Typically, a good Kintsugi repair uh, will break somewhere else uh, if it were to be dropped again than where the uh, repair is done. Now, that being said, if you're using it in the dishwasher sometimes or with excessively hot water, it can weaken the joint anytime the, the ceramic and Darushi repair uh, expand and contract. Expansion and contraction, like anything, given enough expansion and contraction and enough time, will cause something to weaken. So I've ensured that I put lacquer on the entire length that uh, the shard that I'm gonna attach has been on the main piece. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna apply a second layer of lacquer over on uh, the second piece of the shard. Uh, one thing that you'll notice is I'm applying this lacquer paste, this wheat glue lacquer mixture uh, to both sides of the shards. And you'll notice that I'm applying it directly to that white clay body underneath. Uh, this piece is not porcelain. This is a white stoneware, so it does have some porosity to the clay body. If it were porcelain, I may add an additional step that I didn't do here where I thin out Arushi by itself with a little bit of turpentine and paint it on the edge of the porcelain piece before I go into the current step. It can aid in adhesion um, to make the repair uh, a more permanent and longer lasting repair. Uh, if you use a little bit too much of this wheat arushi paste, you do want to go back and try to thin it out a little bit. You'll see me pick some up off the sides, um, try to thin off what I have on the palette knife. I am very, very careful trying to avoid uh, getting the lacquer on my hands. If there's a little bit of excess, use the side of the knife and remove it. Um, you can always remove it after it is cured using a sharp knife, a palette knife, or a sandpaper or grinding stone. Uh, but the more you clean it off, during the initial step, the easier the cleanup is later. Realize it's easier to clean a flat piece than a cylindrical piece, especially if it's on inside that cylindrical piece. So now that I have the two pieces covered in lacquer, I'm going to slide that shard together, uh, give it a little bit of a wiggle and a nice little strong push, and you'll see a little bulge in that material. Um, and you'll notice that it's adhering really, really well. That is the power of that wheat. That wheat glue mixed with the lacquer adds as a temporary adhesive and it makes it so much easier to deal with these pieces when there are multiple shards. I mentioned earlier that I am constantly looking at my gloves here. You might not be able to see in the video, but I got a very small amount of Arushi on the tip of my glove. And because of that, I need to make sure that I'm not gonna touch anything uh, with that glove because if I do it's something where I'm going to be spreading that lacquer around the studio. Uh, now I'm going back to that bigger knife. Uh, you can see that I have a much longer break. It is a faster job on long flat breaks to use this flat headed palette knife. The downside is if I have any areas where I have a sharper joint uh, it may be harder to deal with. I also like the finer detail of the Smaller knife though, to help spread out once I have it on there or to clean up any excess on the side. Um, so just like I did with the prior piece, I'm gonna slowly spread and thin this lacquer across the entire length of the piece here. Uh, if there is any excess, I can use the side of the palette knife to scrape it off. Uh, if it's not a clean scrape off, when I go through and do that, I can always go back later with a little bit of turpentine or even lacquer thinner once it's cured to erase any of that on the side. If it seems like it has solidified completely and neither of those two are working to remove any excess that I may have spilled on the outside, 
Uh, it's nothing that a really fine grain sandpaper won't remove. Uh, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 grit sandpaper is great at removing a little bit of lacquer that you may have left on the piece without disturbing the glaze normally. Um, sometimes you do want to check you know, a small area where it's not going to be noticeable, like the edge of a, a glazed area, to see if the sandpaper roughs up the glaze too much before you do that. But, uh, you know, it is something that, you know, can be done to clean up the work. Clean up, clean up, clean up after your initial repair is what makes a Kinsugi repair look professional versus non. If there's bulging areas of excess lacquer, or today a lot of people are using epoxies, or they're adding uh, the gold to the epoxy, which I would not suggest, um, you know, it doesn't quite look the same as traditional. You can get a pretty traditional looking Kintsugi repair using epoxies if you're using methods very similar to traditional Kintsugi. Uh, when I was getting my graduate degree at NYU and writing my dissertation on conservation of ceramics, uh, my thesis advisor, uh, someone who was a art conservator at MoMA at the time, taught in the museum studies program and in the conservation program at NYU, a gentleman by the name of Glenn Wharton, you know, him and I had several discussions about uh, art conservators in the U.S. using conservation grade materials uh, other than Arushi to do a, what both of us would refer to as a synthetic uh, Kintsugi style repair. Downside with Kintsugi is it's near uh, impossible to reverse. Uh, not impossible, but it's very difficult to reverse re repair. Uh, if you're an art conservator, part of conservation is making sure you have the ability to fix a repair if it was not done properly. So reversible repairs is something that conservation uh, specialists are, are very, very conscious about when they uh, are uh, conserving work. Um, and there were a couple articles that I came across in American conservation uh, periodicals and symposiums where art conservators in the U.S. were talking about doing a synthetic uh, Kintsugi style repair with uh, conservation grade epoxies. And, and again, if you are doing it correctly, it can look very indistinguishable from true kintsugi. One thing that's nice about true kintsugi when you're using a rushi uh, is the fact that not only is the material uh, uh, very, very strong as a repair, also uh, it is food safe. It's been used, a rushi has been used in Japan for hundreds of years. Uh, to repair ceramics, and for thousands of years, Arushi has been used to waterproof surfaces for f food use. Uh, once you have the second piece coated with Arushi, you do want to go back to that first piece. I've allowed that repair that I've done. You can see here in the bottom left uh, corner of the piece, uh, just stick a little bit. Um, I'm going back through now and I'm going to be applying this wheat glue arushi paste along the edge here. Now there are pros and cons to using arushi versus epoxy. Obviously, if you're using arushi, you're using a traditional material. It's also, like I mentioned, the refined sap of the arushi tree, so it is a natural material. Uh, when it has cured, it is food safe. It is ultra, ultra, ultra strong, still has a little bit of flexibility to it. Uh, one of the nice things is one of the only things that can cause it to break down is UV light. Well, if you're dusting the sur surface of the Arushi with gold, like in traditional Kintsugi or silver, um, that gold and silver act as a barrier between the UV light penetrating the Arushi, so the Arushi doesn't break down. Um, you know, it's essentially an organic plastic and it is one of the best materials in the world for uh, conserving uh, ceramic pieces for a function of use. Um, downside and the biggest downside is curing. It does require a proper temperature and humidity control. You know, like I said earlier, 70% humidity at 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 70% humidity at 20 degrees centigrade um, is essential for it to cure properly. Uh, another uh, big downside is that allergic dermatitis. There are a large portion of the population, something like 80% of the population of the world who will have an allergic reaction to using the material. Um, 
I actually visited a school in Kyoto, TASC, it's traditional art school Kyoto, and uh, was just visiting uh, the college in general, a two-year trade school. And one of the trades that they specialize in is makie, traditional Japanese lacquer. And when we went and visited the school and visited the lacquer department, uh, all of the students had their forearms and hands wrapped in bandages. And, and one of my friends asked, you know, why, why do all the students have their arms and forearms wrapped in bandages? And the instructor's response is, oh, they all have a rash. And uh, we asked, well, how long do they get a rash? If they choose to do a rushi, you know, how long do they typically get that reaction? And the instructor said, oh, well, if they're using it every day, they'll typically have a reaction to it, uh, you think poison oak, poison ivy, uh, for about six months. After six months, the reactions tend to subside. Um, you know, that I thought was interesting. You know, those lacquer students are building up an immunity to it. Um, before I go on with the story, we're gonna adhere these two pieces together. So now that I have the two shards, the one that is solid by itself and the one that is solid with the broken end, I'm gonna get them and I'm gonna try to fit them as best I can to their original uh, positions. I'm gonna give it a good amount of pressure to push it in and as I do that, you can see that Arushi material bulge out. Um, you can see on the bottom, I had smeared a little bit. That I will clean up with sandpaper a little bit later after it cures. You can see how it bulges out as I push it in, um, which is gonna be really easy to go through after it has uh, solidified to scrape that off. It's such a thin, thin edge uh, that you know, getting a nice sharp razor blade or potentially my palette knife, I'll be able to uh, clean up that edge and then go over with some really, really fine 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 grit sandpaper to make it nice and smooth on that surface before I do my brushed lacquer application and then my uh, sprinkling of the gold on the surface. But you can see that repair looks really nice. I'm just adding some additional pressure to it. It's a really nice cup here. Um, I'm gonna set it back down and I'm gonna start getting uh, the final shard that I have for this piece prepped. And what you can see is, uh, it's gonna fit in right here on the edge. Uh, it is gonna be missing a small little piece. Uh, pieces like this are a little bit more difficult to deal with uh, because it is very likely that I will end up getting some additional uh, arushi on my fingers during this process. So back to that pro and con uh, story. So at task, the instructor you know, mentioned that the students have the rash for about six months. So doing some additional research into it, um, it turns out that there are some people who just have a natural uh, immunity or natural lack of allergic reaction to the material. Uh, that being said, there are other individuals who have very severe reactions to the materials. Um, so, you know, choosing to use that lacquer, uh, you know, is, is a choice that someone has to make. You know, one of the downsides is there are people who don't have any reaction the first couple times they come in contact with it. And as they're more exposed to it, they end up with a more severe allergic reaction. Um, so that is something to consider. Uh, now that I have that one piece uh, covered with the lacquer wheat glue, I'm gonna go through and yeah, add some additional adhesive to the consolidated piece thus far, the repaired piece thus far, to get ready for the other piece to repair. So while I'm applying my wheat arushi glue on the surface here, let's talk briefly about the, the, the pros and cons of epoxy. Pro, it cures really fast. Anyone can use it. Cons. The reason it cures fast is there's solvents in it and these solvents are really toxic. Uh, they're not things that generally you wanna have on food surfaces. Um, there are several FDA compliant uh, food grade epoxies on the market. Uh, one of the downsides though is a lot of them aren't high heat resistant. It's important to make sure that the ones that you're choosing to use, if you're choosing to use them on a coffee mug, uh, that you know they are high heat resistant. I have an epoxy that is manufactured for me that is both high heat resistant and FDA uh, compliant. Um, it's something that you do wanna look to if you are planning on using epoxies. Uh, the other downside about epoxy is most epoxies can cause aller allergic dermatitis very similar to the uh, Arushi. Um, most people don't take the time to read the SDSs, the safety data sheets for the materials that they use. Um, there's a lot of people doing kintsugi today, and a lot of them are using non-food grade epoxies, and they haven't even thought about it. 
So the final step here is going to be me adhering this last little piece. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going through and pressing it in really, really nice and firmly to make sure that I have good adhesion. Um, this final piece, uh, you'll see that bulging material as well. What you're going to notice is in that top left corner, top right corner, there are areas of loss. After the piece cures the way that I currently have it, I'm going to be filling those two areas to deal with that loss, that loss compensation. Uh, I will, he in the, the process of filling these, I'll end up using a traditional fill material uh, for the small crack, which is going to be uh, a clay called Tonoko that is mixed with Arushi, very similar to the wheat uh, flour was mixed with the Rushi to fill that small piece. piece. The bigger piece, uh, that's a relatively big piece to make uh, that way. So here, what I'm gonna be using in that bigger area of loss compensation, I'm gonna be uh, either making a piece out of wood that will fit in there perfectly, making a piece out of ceramic that will fit in there perfectly, or actually doing what uh, I was just talking about, using a food grade, uh, epoxy to make a fill piece, a uh, food grade epoxy putty in this instant. Uh, it gives me a little bit more of a form uh, material that I can, I can form and put in place. Once I have that uh, formed properly, I will adhere it using uh, the Arushi and then I will coat the entire surface of it with Arushi. And after I have done that, everything will get a nice clean sand. So I have a beautiful, smooth, reddish brown uh, repair. And then the final step will be applying that Benigara Arushi on the surface and dusting it with gold. So probably the most important part is the curing. So I have a plastic container. I'm gonna get this plastic container. I'm gonna get a damp paper towel. Uh, important to be damp. I'm going to make sure that I have some sort of stilt to elevate the piece. This piece has a crack on the bottom. I don't wanna smear what's on the bottom and a lid to make sure I can keep the humidity within my curing chamber. Uh, and also, yes, 46% humidity. Uh, at 65 degrees, it's a little bit too low, both for humidity and temperature. Um, but that is the current condition in the room that I am in. I'm grabbing my beautifully repaired piece. Uh, you can see the bulges, all that will get cleaned up after the cure. Uh, this is gonna go right into my humidity chamber. Uh, and I'm gonna put the lid on top. From here, once I have this lid on top, I'm gonna to be putting this into a heat box set at seven degrees Fahrenheit. And that humidity will go up. I will show you what it looks like after it's been in there for about half an hour uh, to give you an idea of how the humidity and temperature look. So if I remove the lid and look in here after half an hour, you can see that it is currently at 77% humidity and about 78, 79 degrees Fahrenheit. Pretty ideal conditions. It's gonna sit in here for 24 hours. And then after that 24 hours, I do some minor cleanup and put it back in here for a week.